day? I'm doing good. All right. How about yourself? Yep, not today. Oh, I love your dress. something in our lives? Are we captive to rigid ideas that diminish others? Are we captive to fears that seem to offer only a fight or flight response? Disciples have an opportunity to bring humanity to the holy dwelling place of our amazing God. Thank you, Dave, for giving us a call in our hearts to worship. Uh, today, on the 16th Sunday after the day of Pentecost, we greet you. In the name of our loving, gracious Lord Jesus our Christ. Let's look at a couple, just a couple highlights for the week. They're there for you to read yourself, but I'll just highlight that on uh, Tuesday, the United Leadership Team will be meeting at 6.30. And on Wednesday, uh, there's a prayer vigil here uh, at the Breckenridge Church for both churches, um, being led by Christy, and that's at 7 p.m. And I know she has a wonderful, wonderful prayer vigil uh, planned. Uh, so please try to try to be at that this week uh, for all our prayer uh, needs. With that, I'll ask uh, Dave to call our hearts to worship. Would you please stand as you're able and join me in the, the uh, opening dialogue here? Life is 
heart, evil is all around. The powers of darkness rise against us. We stand firm in our God. Put on the full armor of God. He will wear the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the sword of faith, and the helmet of salvation. Life is hard. Evil is all around. We will put on the shoes of peace. We are strong in the Lord. Now please remain standing for our hymn of praise. A mighty fortress is our God. <laughs>
years uh, uh, needed before us uh, this day. You have that written list uh, on the back of your uh, uh, bulletin. Uh, uh, Bob Edgar got his permission from his cardiologist this week to go ahead with that needed hernia surgery. So we continue to keep Bob and Jan in our prayers as they now await a, a date uh, for upcoming surgery. We've got some good news. The Breckenridge High School student who was injured in the football game a couple of weeks ago and uh, Linda Nagel's nephew, help me, Jim Bedrodi, are both doing uh, much, much better. And so we want to give them the thanks and the praise for that. We're missing Nancy Sensabaugh this morning. She's had a uh, tough night, and so let's lift Nancy uh, throughout our, our week uh, ahead. And maybe she'll have a stronger and a, and a better week. Again, let's pray. Father, we come to you this day, our Creator God, our Savior, our Encourager Spirit. We come knowing that each of us needs something, and you know what those things are. We know that we all need a healing. We need a physical healings. We need emotional healings. And we need spiritual healings. So we come before you, lifting folks by name, lifting folks that are on our written list, and listing needs that still remain in our hearts and our minds. We ask you to just touch each of us in the ways that are needed. We'll give you the thanks and the praise, always and everywhere. Amen. Join me in that little uh, choral response. We're only going to sing through it once uh, today. So um, 2200 in the faith that we sing are up on the screen. Singing through it once today. some of you 
And so you've made my heart really glad this morning by being here. Last week we started talking about putting on the armor of God, both the big kids and the younger ones, well, younger ones, <laughs> are now talking about the armor of God. Today, the big kids will be done, but you folks are going to be talking about putting on the armor of God for a number of weeks yet. So last week, we talked about the special equipment that a baseball catcher would have to wear. So I'm just going to think about that for a minute. All that different equipment that they have to have. Today, I want us to think about what you have to wear when you're skateboarding. Anybody skateboard? Mm -hmm. A little bit? No? Never? Anybody skateboard? <laughs> I've been on one. <laughs> so you are supposed to put on some special equipment when you're skateboarding. What do you put on, Sophia? Uh, knee pad. Knee pad. Yay. What do you put on, Reagan? A helmet. Yay. What do you put on? What? Elbow pads. And if you look, he's got those on. He's missing a couple of things that I would want to have on if I was skateboarding. Is anything missing? He's got the helmet. He's got the knee and elbow pads. He's got uh, probably some kind of special tennis shoes on. I would want what? What? Special pants? Hmm. Or longer pants, right? He looks like he's got short sons, so we know what that might mean if you fall down. It sounds like you've been there. <laughs> One of the things he doesn't have on that I would want on is, is gloves. Oh. Oh. Uh, I found that to be a mistake on, his, on that person's part, because if you do have to go down, uh, I would like to have something covering my hands, but uh, God gives us special armor. He asks us to put it on every morning before our day gets going. It's part of the Holy Scriptures. So he tells us to put on the belt of truth. That's what the kids talked about last week. He tells us to put on the breastplate of righteousness. He tells us to put on special shoes or sandals of peace. He asks us to carry the shield of faith. He asks us to put on a helmet of salvation. And he gives us a sword of the spirit. Now that was six things. The first five things are all for our protection just like the skateboarder or like the catcher in baseball has to wear. And then he gives us the sword of spirit, of the spirit, which is his word, his Bible, for us to follow every day. And we're you supposed to use God's word, God's Bible, to also protect us, but to um, lead others uh, to Christ. And so those are the things you're going to be talking about over the next couple of weeks. The belt of truth was last week. And uh, today I think you're going to do the breastplate or maybe another part of the, the armor, whatever the, the kids church leader has for you to do today. But I hope like you and the adults will start to think about all the resources that God gives us to make our day better, to make our life and help us to be stronger disciples for Jesus Christ. I hope you have a, a wonderful time in class um, today and over the next uh, couple of, of weeks. So, we have to say a goodbye uh, today. So, Miss Emily, come on up. <laughs> and Miss Leisha, no. <laughs> Miss Emily has gotten me a promotion. Yeah. And it's going to benefit her, but it means saying goodbye to us, at least for now. And so 
We want to welcome, wish her well uh, today and let her know that she will continue to be in our prayers and in our hearts and that she has done an amazing job as our nursery staff. We want her to know that. Yes. Please just have some. Today's epistle lesson, lesson comes from Ephesians. Uh, I'm reading from the Message Bible. And that about wraps it up. God is strong, and he wants you strong. So take everything the Master has set out for you, well-made weapons of the best materials, and put them to use so you will be able to stand up to everything the devil throws your way. This is no weekend war that we'll walk away from and forget about in a couple of hours. This is for keeps, a life or death fight to finish against the devil and all his angels. Be prepared. You're up against far more than you can handle on your own. Take all the help you can get, every weapon God has issued, so that when it's all over, but the shouting, you'll still be on your feet. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, and salvation are more than words. Learn how to apply them. You'll need them throughout your life. God's word is an indispensable weapon. In the same way, prayer is essential in this ongoing warfare. Pray hard and long. Pray for your brothers and sisters. Keep your eyes open. Keep each other's spirits up so that no one falls behind or drops out. And don't forget to pray for me. Pray that I'll know what to say and have the courage to say it at the right time. Telling the mystery to one and all. The message that I, jailbird preacher as I am, am responsible for getting out. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now our hymn of preparation, Standing on the Promises, on the screen or page 374 in the hymn book. Stand as you're able. You can't sit down for this one. <laughs> Standing on the promises of God.
today for that reading from the message, that contemporary paraphrase of God's word from Eugene Peterson gives us a little different perspective on the scriptures covering the armor of God. And remember that this is Paul, the apostle, writing to the early church at Ephesus while he is being held in prison. Last week we began to look at the six parts of a wonderful resource that God has given us to use as we strengthen our path of discipleship. He gives us the armor of God. Last week we looked at putting on the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. So today we need to look briefly at the last four pieces of armor. Putting on the shoes or the sandals of peace, holding the shield of faith, putting on the helmet of hope or salvation, and using the sword of the spirit, the God's word, not only the strength of our lives, but other lives in our midst. When looking at all of this armor, I encourage you to go back and read it for yourself. And I highly encourage you to begin the practice of putting your armor on each and every day before you do anything else. I know that that's a hard call for many folks. But God gives us these resources for a purpose. And I encourage you to use them. Several centuries before Christ, the prophet Isaiah wrote, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good tidings, who publishes peace. And when the Hebrews foretold the coming of a divine deliverer, they said his name would be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. In the fullness of time, at the right time, when the Savior was born, angelic choruses in the nativity story of the shepherds sing, on earth, peace amongst men with whom God is pleased. The word of God taken in its full sweep is a gospel of peace, good news, peace. So it's not surprising that when the Apostle Paul comes to describe the armor of God, which the Christian is to put on daily, Paul should include the element of peace. And having shod your feet with the equipment of the gospel of peace. How does the warrior for Christ Put on the gospel shoes of peace. First, I think Paul would tell us that we need to put on an ordinary, an orderly inner personal life to get our personal inner life in order. The Chinese have a proverb that the longest journey begins with the first step. When we're trying to learn some new spiritual task, the Christian peacemaker must start with God and themselves. That's where we have to start. It starts with our personal relationship with our Creator God. Paul puts the breastplate of righteousness just ahead of the shoes of peace, for righteousness is the preparation for peace. Jesus enlisting the Beatitudes puts blessed are the pure in heart just before blessed are the peacemakers. <coughs> so we who would make peace must first bring our own life into harmony with God. 
the warrior, once having brought their own personal life into God's control, secondly, equips themselves with a creative good will. Peacemaking calls for tireless and creative good will. God's reconciler radiates good will even by his or her thoughts. Having pure motives in our minds encourages worthy motives in other people's minds. The peacemaker will also radiate goodwill by our words. The Christian peacemaker is our reconciling force by his or her deeds as well as by their thoughts and their words. So thoughts, words, and deeds. We must overcome evil, and there is evil in our world around us. We can overcome that evil with our good, by continuing to love, by continuing to share grace, we will win the wars. When we try to counteract evilness by adopting the methods of evilness, we will be defeated by them. Along with an orderly inner life and a creative goodwill, there's a third element in the equipment of the gospel of peace. This is an organized fellowship. The disciple who puts on the armor of God is not meant to fight alone. We have to serve in the army of the Lord. This letter to the Ephesians from Paul also depicts the sweeping fellowship of the church, the whole family of God to be a blessing for us. Next, Paul asks us to take up a shield of faith. There was a time when the house of God offered physical safety. In England, over 400 years ago, persons pursued by their enemies could fling themselves across the threshold of a cathedral, crying, sanctuary, and they would be safe from all attack. No warring could take place within the house of the church. Even those that were fleeing from the law, accepting crimes of treason or sacrilege, could rush into the church and be exempt from arrest, regardless of guilt or innocence. But no longer does the church afford such protection. The house of God is no longer shelter from the arm of the law or from the attack of invaders. Nor was the early Christian church in Paul's day a place of physical safety. It was quite the opposite. To join the Christian church was to enter a danger zone in the time of the Caesars. When the Apostle Paul bade his Christian converts to put on the armor of God, he was not offering it as a protection against bodily dangers. Paul was primarily concerned at that time about arming our minds and our spirits so that when something happened to our body, we would not be hurt or embittered or destroy the soul. To that end, Paul offered the girdle of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, 
the shoes of peace, and now the fourth equipment in the armor of God, he says, above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you can quench all the flaming darts of the evil one. So how does the shield of faith help to protect us from the world's evils? First, the shield of faith can give us a protecting calm. Paul says the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We talk much about peace of mind. Multitudes think they will find peace if their business is going well, or if friends flock around, or if they can somehow find relaxation and comfort for their bodies. But how can one have peace under physical hardships such as Paul endured in prison? Faith in God calms us of a sense of continued presence when the things we care for are taken away from us. All of the earthly comforts were taken from Paul. And yet, because of his personal relationship with God, he was able to maintain that peace that calm. I wish that for all of us. Faith in God protects us with a calming sense of steadying strength. When John Wesley was returning to England from his missionary experience in the colonies of Georgia of America, his ship was engulfed in a heavy storm at sea. John Wesley, man of faith, was frightened to death. But on that ship were other Moravian missionaries who seemed utterly unafraid. History says they stood on the deck of the ship singing hymns, spiritual hymns, in the midst of the storm. Wesley saw that they had a faith and poise which he did not possess. He sought their secret out. His search led him eventually to the deep heart longing experience from which the Methodist movement stemmed. Secondly, faith in God is a shield which provides protecting conscience. Our Creator puts a conscience into each of us, but God doesn't guarantee to keep it in condition. Our consciences, like our bodies, need care and exercise to keep them fit. The conscience must be watched even more closely than the body, because its illnesses do not always make themselves known. By aches and pains. It takes work to keep a conscience truly clear. Sometimes a person thinks his or her conscience is clear simply because their head and heart are empty. They have not informed themselves sufficiently to see the issues involved. It takes work to keep one's conscience free. When we do take pains, when we do the work to develop a good conscience, free and clear, it provides itself a shield to ward off the attacks of the temptations before they reach our mind. And now along with a protecting calm and a protecting conscience, the 
the shield of faith gives a protecting courage. Paul said to Timothy, rekindle the gift of God that is within you. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and love and self-control. Each of us can do something to stir up our God-given courage. Christ gives a way of kindling courage. He didn't manifest his courage because his back was to the wall, but he manifested his courage because his face was leading towards the Heavenly Father. Christian courage is born not out of desperation. It's born out of dependence on God and God alone. The Christian faith is a shield which gives a protecting courage also when sickness lays us low. With such Christian faith, a person is shielded from being <clears throat> depressed or defeated by anything that comes. Like Paul, we can say, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us first. For I'm sure that neither death, nor life, nor things present, nor things to come, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus good scripture to memorize. We now come to the helmet of hope or the helmet of salvation. Paul says, and take the helmet of salvation. In his first letter to the Thessalonians, Paul says this a bit more explicitly. He says, and for a helmet, take the hope of salvation. Paul saw hope as one of the raw materials of life which abide. So faith, hope, and love abide. These three. And they abide because they are integral parts of our makeup. Paul fashioned the raw materials of hope into a helmet of salvation. He tells us the steps. Tribulation makes patience. And patience, experience. And experience, hope. Professor Edwin Aubrey's translation of those lines are the pressures of life develop staying power, and staying power develops competence, and competence develops hope. If we are to find assuring hope, we must develop patience or staying power. It's not a popular virtue with us, is it? that patience thing. It's one of my downfalls. Modern living tends to make us more impatient than in biblical times. In those days, men made their living largely from the soil, and yes, some of you do still today. They had to be patient with the seasons. When they traveled by land, they had to adjust their gait to the beasts of burdens. They couldn't have. When they 
traveled by sea. They are pretty dependent on the winds. But we live in a machine age. We drive cars which don't seem to tire and they go faster and faster and our lives go faster and faster. The multitudes who live in cities don't have to adjust themselves to the slow, slow process of the soil. But while we can raise January strawberries and hothouses, we must remember that we cannot erase the fruits of the Spirit that are gift to us from God. Love, joy, peace, patience, generosity, kindness, self-control. We can't grow those by hothouse methods. We have to work at them to make them a part of our lives. While we can turn on a light in a room by just pressing a button and sometimes just walking into the room, the light comes on. We must remember that we cannot turn on the light of hope in a dark world by quick mechanical means. We must wait on the Lord if we are to renew our spirit and our strength, our hope is in the Lord. Hope is the helmet of salvation. It saves the individual with hope of life beyond this world. Hallelujah. How all of us want that kind of hope. The last piece of the Christian warrior's equipment is the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of of God, the Holy Scriptures. The first five parts of the armor of God or are for the protection of the wearer. We have the girdle or the belt of truth. We put on the breastplate of righteousness. We put on the shoes or sandals of peace. And we carry the shield of faith. And we put on the helmet of hope. All of these are designed for defense. But the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, is a weapon for offensive action. The Christian is called not only to withstand evil, but also to fight for the good. Let's see then how the sword of the spirit supplements the other pieces of armor. First of all, it is the Christian's weapon in the fight for truth. Truth is basic. The search for truth is a task which often costs a struggle. Often we think our heart is right because we have not really studied our thoughts. The follower of Christ must search their thoughts until they know their own mind and know why and how they believe and feel the things they do. The Word of God is living sharper than any two-edged sword, Scripture tells us, piercing to the division of soul and spirit and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And it's always the intentions of the heart that God looks at in our lives. First and foremost, the intentions of our heart. When the scripture speaks of the word of God, it means the living words of God, which come to you and me when we are attuned to the Holy Spirit. And when we feel that our hearts are right, then we need to listen intently to hear God's voice. God will awaken us 
to discover our weakness, God will cut like a sword through the film of wishful thinking and lay bare our real motives. God will cleanse from the lens of our vision the prejudice and bias which prevent us from seeing the truth when it's presented to us. God will purge us of double-mindedness so that with purity of heart we shall see God in the midst of ungodliness. We have to fight in order to free our own minds from error and inertia. And having done that, we are to become witnesses of truth for others. The follower of Christ must first become one who rings true. True enough to vibrate to the truth as it was voiced by Christ and Christ alone. And then we, like our Lord, must go forth to bear witness to that truth. That means we must inform ourselves to the best of our ability on issues that matter. We must come to some vital conclusions and then we need to stand. Stand in our real promises. We need to stand for our convictions. Not arguing to prove ourselves right, but discussing to see what is right. We have to speak the truth in love. Secondly, the sword of the Spirit enables us to fight for righteousness. Of course, we need the breastplate of righteousness to, to protect us from the evils and temptations which test us. You remember in the scriptures where the Pharisee who thanked God that he was not like other men, unjust, extortioners, adulterers. Remember that story? Be sure that was good, that he wasn't doing those things, that it wasn't good enough, Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. It's not enough for me to refrain from injustice. What am I doing? To fight for justice and righteousness in my community and beyond. What am I doing to improve the morals of youth and strengthen the fidelity of families? In a time when righteousness is fighting such a tough battle with evil on so many fronts, can I be a follower of Christ? And stay out of the fight. The church with all of its defects is the world's most powerful organization for good. It brings us hope. It offers the longest lever of helpfulness. It helps Christians to do can together what they cannot do alone. The question is then, can we be a part of the family of God and not be in the fight for Christ's army? When we take the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, we are impelled to use the best we have for the highest we know in the fight for righteousness. In the third place, the sword of the Spirit helps us to fight for peace. Not our kind of peace. God's kind of peace, Shalom. The shoes of peace are included in the armor of God. There's no word more 
a welcome to our ears in the word peace. Drop into the church some week as you go about your day. Just drop in. Let the spell of its beauty and quietness steal over your rushing spirit. Look at the cross on the altar. Look at the stained glass window of our Good Shepherd. Let your thoughts run back to the Christ who reached out his arms, saying, Come to me, all of you, all who labor and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. And you will begin to feel peace into your heart. But keep looking at the cross. Think of the breadth and the length and the depth and the height of the love revealed on that empty cross. Do you not begin to be disturbed by the awareness of your own shortcomings? Do you not begin to understand why Christ said, I have not come to bring peace but a sword. When we catch the sympathy of Christ, what it is he has done for each of us, we start to share the sufferings of Christ. The follower of Christ is not content with a shallow peace of mind which comes from a comfortable adjustment to easy circumstances. We fight Christ we fight through our own personal laziness and selfishness to the peace, the shalom of God, which passes worldly understanding. On the last night of his earthly life, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. A disciple has sword of the spirit to attain a peace like that which can keep us from the cross when the cross awaits us tomorrow and it does the cross is there we will not any of us go on forever there will come a time a day when we kneel before the throne of God see our Christ face to face. In the fourth place, the sword of the Spirit helps us to fight for faith. The Christian is to put on the shield of faith which offers protection from so many of life's ills and evils. We are be, being repeatedly told that faith can shield us from just Needless pains, things we don't have to, to worry about. But Christian faith is not content with mere self-protection. Christian faith is more than a shield for our own protection. It's a sword for use to help others in the struggle. us to fight for and with hope. The Christian is encouraged put, to put on the helmet of hope and salvation for hope is a weapon as well as a protection. Hope never in ourselves but always in our triune God the God who offers us the armor of God as a resource tool for daily living as a disciple on the path. I pray, really do pray, that we will all begin to put that armor of God on. We 
each and every day to strengthen our path. God's promises. Yeah. Amen. As we come into the time of offering, we want you to know that we are eternally grateful for the gifts that you've given of your time, your talent, and your prayers, in person or online. Would the ushers please come forward? Please stand for the doxology. Savior God, you look at our world with compassion. You also look at our world with clarity and a zeal for justice. Use all that we bring to life and all that we bring to you today to fight for justice with mercy and compassion. 
Make us and our gifts part of the healing of the world. Amen. Amen. We've got our video hymn today, our hymn of the month. Uh, if any good enough to, you can stand or be seated, whatever you wish to do, but I hope that you will start to sing along. Pastor says I'm able to play video. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Well, okay. Well, <laughs> if you remember the words to that, it talks about the struggles in life, the reality of life, but it also talks about being thankful that we know God. Do you know God deep within your soul? How is it with your soul? Questions to ask us today. Thank God that we know a gracious, loving God who is with us in spite of everything else. I want to share a poem with you today that was given to me by Christy, who received it from her daughter, <laughs> and it was written by Jennifer Chapman. Church is hard. Church is hard for the person walking through the doors, afraid of judgment. Church is hard for the pastor's family under the microscope of an entire body. Church is hard for the prodigal soul returning home, broken and battered by the world. Church is hard for the girl who looks like she has it all together but she doesn't. Church is hard for the couple who fought the entire ride to the service. Church is hard for the single mom, surrounded by couples holding hands and seemingly perfect families. Church is hard for the widow and widower with no invitation to lunch after service. Church is hard for the church leader with an estranged child. Church is hard for the person singing worship songs, overwhelmed by the weight of the lyrics. Church is hard for the man, insecure as in his role as a leader. Church is hard for the wife who longs to be led by a righteous man. Church is hard for the nursery volunteer who desperately longs for a baby to hold. Church is hard for the single woman and single man praying God brings them a mate. Church is hard for the teenage girl wearing the scarlet letter ashamed for her mistakes. Church is hard for the sinners. Church is hard for me. It's hard because on the outside it all looks shiny and perfect. Sunday best in behavior and dress. However, underneath those layers, you find a body of imperfect people, carnal souls, selfish motives, but here is the beauty of church. Church isn't a building. It's not mentality or it's expectation. Church is a body. Church is a group of sinners saved by grace, living in fellowship as saints. Church is a body of believers bound as brothers and sisters in eternal love. Church is a holy ground where sinners stand as equals before the throne of grace. Church is a refuge for broken hearts and a training ground for mighty warriors. Church is a converging of confrontation and invitation. Where sin is confronted and hearts are invited to seek restoration. Church is a lesson in faith and trust. Church is a bearer of burdens and a giver of hope. Church is a family. A family coming together setting aside differences, forgetting past mistakes, rejoicing in the smallest of victories. 
church, the body, and the circle of sinners turned cities in where God resides. And if we ask, God is faithful. God is faithful to come to each of us. God's shalom.